Now I will move on to medium resolution sounds as I promised and small angle x-ray scattering together. So I let me remind you, I talked to you about double crystal based medium resolution sounds in Dhruva. You can see a photograph of that on the guide tube. The monochromatic is silicon 111, one which is inside the guide, you can see it. And the second monochromator is on the plate. So you can see that this is on the guide. And we have a wavelength of 0.312 nanometer or it is 3.12 angstrom. And you have the second monochromator which is shown here, here, silicon disc, uh, which is raw. And this, when we rock it, I copy the rocking of the first uh, silicon monochromator if there is no sample in between. When we put sample in between these two, then this sample, one is that this has some inherent broadening the beam, which is um, not the mosaic spread because it's a perfect single crystal, it's a Darwin width. It's a Darwin width. But when I put the sample between the two, then that causes a broadening of the beam and when I rock the second crystal, when I rock the second crystal, then I copy this broadening onto my detector and by in this way I can go to a lower Q value because the inherent beam, the incident beam is very very narrow <coughs> and I can talk about length scales 40 to 1000 nanometer. So, I have given a list of the lambda, delta lambda by lambda is very good, 1% and the flux is low. Flux is low if must accept it because it's a single crystal diffraction which is coming from the first crystal from a polycrystalline, for a polychromatic beam and I get only 500 neutrons per centimeter square per second and then the detector is a BF3 detector, end on detector and the Q range please know that it is 0.003 to 0.17 nanometer inverse. So if I translate it into angstrom, 1 nanometer inverse is 0.1 angstrom inverse because 1 nanometer is equal to 10 angstrom. That means this goes to 0.0003 angstrom inverse <coughs> to 0.017 angstrom inverse. So really speaking, this is actually covering a different Q range compared to what I showed you earlier. You see 0 0.01 to 0 0.2 angstrom inverse. Just I take an example of surfactant induced protein unfolding. So I am in a different range of Q and different range of problems also. So this instrument has been used for studying ceramics, cements, pores in cements, metallurgical alloys and microgranules. I will take an example from the microgranules. So this being in a lower Q range, it can see larger sizes. So if I consider 1 by 0 0.003, it becomes 1000 divided by 3. That is a delta R resolution as per uncertainty principle and then you can see that you can see very large objects using this machine. So I will just, there have been many examples, I will choose one example here. These are silicon microgranules. Now we have silicon nanoparticles, we have purchased silicon nanoparticles, they are nanoparticles of small size. You put them in solution throw it in a spray dryer and let the water evaporate because spray dryer has heating and then what you get is structures like this. These structures like this. You can see the nanoparticles here and you can see the overall structure which is spherical. So I am just here but depending on the temperature at which you dry up the granules, depending on the temperature, now this Assembly of these nanoparticles can be different structure. 
but first what i promised you how you can stitch together small angle neutron scattering and small angle excess scattering data you can see here this part of the data the larger q side was taken using exactly same structure we are doing small angle x ray scattering and the principle of and the design of instruments are very very similar you have a large flight path you have a collimator to collimate down the beam and you have a detector so this data and this data they are stitched together and you can see that we have covered a very large q range 10 to the power minus 3 nanometer inverse that means 10 to the power minus 4 angstrom inverse to 1 angstrom inverse and basically in the overlap region we match the sample i mean we basically scale the x ray data and also x scale the error functions so and then we get a continuous curve so this is the matching of m sans here with sax this is used at other places also where you can even do in situ i'll use an example in my later part so this is a stitching of sans data and sax data to cover a large q range and you can see the fits this fits give me the basically the dimension and the structure of the assembly of nanoparticles so this is a commercial spray dryer which is available with us this is a very large length scale 0.5 micrometer means 5000 angstrom but you can see depending on the drying temperature check this depending on the drying temperature you get various right from spherical you can get something like a toroidal 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 structure you will get even interesting structures i will come to it shortly so depending on the heating you can play the structure of this i can say micro uh, assembly of nanoparticles and that makes a very interesting thing that here while we were drying in the spray dryer uh, we added an e coli e coli bacteria which you know which can cause stomach upset and all e coli bacteria in the solution so what happens when these structures form they also accommodate the e coli in their structures e coli in their structures and then you can see this is the structures form on drying and if i burn out the e coli then we have these gaps we have these gaps which can accommodate e coli in this and an attempt was made i have given the reference here an attempt was made now that we first when we were drying the silicon particles we added an e coli bacteria to it so and then we burnt out the e coli bacteria and you please see it is i q multiplied by q to the 4 and it is again stitched m sans data and sax data this rise because you have multiplied it by q to the power 4 to see the porous region and the surface area of this structure so when we do it then there are gaps in it which can accommodate e coli and then when we use try to use it as a water filter interestingly it could filter out the e coli e coli bacteria so this is a work which i would say we started with myself went into protein unfolding of biology this is almost like a i can say application where if we use assembly of such nano structures then you can actually make a setup we know that water filters are used in every home here this water filter can actually remove e coli bacteria from water this setup was made and this was the testing so with this example i come to an end of the q range that can be used in Dhruva and the kind of studies that have been undertaken on these instruments, and I you can see that the small angle neutron scattering is important for basic as well as applied fields uh, from the examples in micelles, protein unfolding, and this 
removal of E. coli bacteria. Now, this same SANS machine has also been used to understand the loading, waste loading in cement matrix. Now, waste loading means it's an important thing. In nuclear technology, when we run reactors, we create lots of waste. Lots of waste means nuclear waste, which needs to be first immobilized and then stored. Immobilized, they are immobilized in glasses. They can also be immobilized in cement because cement has lots of pores. And those pore sizes were studied using MSANS. And we could see that the fractal dimensions decrease when you start loading this cement with nuclear waste and how the fractal dimension changes. This is also another example of application of SANS to understand the importance of utilizing cement for immobilizing nuclear waste. With this, I come to some other examples. Actually, these are earlier examples. This work, this work, these work on various polymers were undertaken at uh, NIST in USA. So, one is that you can see that the polymers are basically linear chains, chains, and in solutions they fold up. They tend to fold up, and the radius of gyration from the Guinea region can be found out. So this is a pleuronics, uh, pleuronics uh, polymer, and in deuterated water, this gives an Rg of 34 angstrom. That means this folds up with a structure which has got a radius of gyration which is 34 angstrom, and. Similarly, dendrimer is another uh, multi-branch uh, polymer, also studied there, and you can see that the log plot is a straight line, various values of, because the slopes are different, the radius of gyration differs based on the concentration of the dendrimer in deuterated water. So, this is another example of finding out radius of gyration of polymers using small angle neutron scattering. This work was done at NIST in USA, NIST reactor in Gettysburg. I will just quickly mention the SANS instruments at various major sources. I have taken an example of a SANS instrument, of the SANS instruments that are available at ICS neutron source, Palatian neutron source in uh, Rutherford Appleton laboratory. There are number of small angle machines because of their high demand. One the most used is LoQ, Sandal 2D, Larmer and Zoom. All of these are small angle neutron scattering machines and the structure of the machines are similar to what you find in a reactor only thing is that here we use time of flight techniques to determine the lambda and the q values. Otherwise, the rest of the structures remain same. So, like low q is a relatively simple instrument. So, always the flight path, depending on the collimation and the intensity of neutron that you can retain, you try to make the flight path long because you need good collimation and you make the flight path long. So, there is a long flight path before the sample and after the sample you have a long flight path because the further you take your detector, if I put a two dimensional detector on the detector, the small q value or small q scattered data will be well separated from the direct beam if you can go farther apart. So we have to have a large flight path before the sample to collimate the beam and we have to have a large flight but after the sample to determine small q data to get the small q data. So there is an 11 meter evacuated beam line down which the neutrons fly toward the sample. I have taken it from their source and then we have got the hit a fixed two dimensional detector 4 meters away. Sometimes you can play with the distance of the detector depending how much resolution you want. And 
Loki you can investigate sizes from 1 to 100 nanometers. Length scale up to 400 nanometer can be probed in highly anisotropic systems. Similarly, I have just given what they have written in their site for SANS 2D. So basically, size, shape and internal structure and spatial arrangement. These are important. Size, shape, like many times we have fitted prolets, spheroidiocene, we have found out the fractal dimension. So those are the internal structures and the spatial arrangement in nanomaterials, soft matter. And all the things I discussed so far, they are soft matter. Soft matter means they are viscoelastic, they have, they are like, uh, they have uh, very small shear stress to, to sort of shear their shapes and they can be bent easily and that's the definition of soft stress as a soft material as I told you that the studies of them are very important today uh, for science as well as for applications. So this is just a schematic of the LOQ instrument. You can see that the large flight path before the sample and there is a large flight path after the sample <coughs> excuse me which this dictates the collimation this dictates the resolution with collimation on the detector similarly if I talk about the high flux research reactor at ILL Grenoble there are D11, D22 and D16 there are more I just chose these, they are the small angle neutron machines and you can see that polymers and colloids, I gave you examples on polymers, polymer blends, micelles, dendrimers, I showed you the dendrimers used with uh, rigid spacer based Gemini surfactants, phase separations in alloys and gas glasses, I didn't show an example of that, super alloys, biological macromolecules, I will also, I will also give an example of flux line lattice in superconductors. It's a very, very interesting work, extremely interesting from fundamental science and I'll explain this to you. And similar range of studies that you can deal with D22. So now <clears throat> I will talk about flux lattice line. Again, the structure is very similar. You can see there's a neutron guide, large flight path. And I just show you this, keep showing you the schematics because small angle machines have a general criteria of a large flight path before the sample to collimate the beam and the large flight path after the sample to dictate or to detect the good resolution for small angle machines. And uh, okay, I must mention here, these detectors are actually two dimensional position sensitive detector. That means I cannot discuss with you the functioning of it. I discussed with you earlier about one dimensional position sensitive detectors that the position is sensed on a where, where it is, where the neutron beam hits depending on the charge they get on both sides. Now in these things, in these detectors, two dimensional detectors, you have got a cross of these wires. In a very simplistic way, I am trying to tell you. Now, if I can, if the neutron hits here, I can find out on the x axis and y axis where the neutron has been detected and assign the intensity to that particular pixel, and ultimately you get a structure, figure like this. So, if it is a two dimensional detector, you might get a circular cone of intensity on this which is small angle intensity. So this is a small angle intensity because of this distance this x and if this L is large then x by L will be giving me the small angle intensity. Now <clears throat> let me introduce you to flux lattices. I have jumped a subject so I have responsibility of telling you what is a superconductor and what is a D wave superconductor. The thing is that uh, we must have been taught in your master's degree that in superconductor you have Cooper pairs and 
Hooper pairs form between two electrons and also at the macroscopic length scale if I plot magnetism versus field in a type 1 superconductor up to some screen the system resists so it is minus m the entry of the field and then the superconductivity is destroyed and the field enters the medium but in type this is type 1 type 1 in a type 2 superconductor the at some field it starts pen penetrating penetrating the medium and then so then there is a field called HC1 HC1 where the field starts penetrating the medium and at the field HC2 the field completes the penetration and the superconductor becomes normal here in type 1 it suddenly goes normal and the superconductivity disappears so superconductivity is a medium which is perfect superconductor is known as perfect diamagnet which does not allow <coughs> does not allow entry of magnet field but in type 1 it suddenly allows the magnetic field entry and becomes normal in type 2 superconductor there are vortices that means magnetism magnetic flux lines are in form of vortices and these vortices actually if I take a superconductor cross section there are these vortices there are these vortices which can come this is because it was shown by Abikos of Gorkov that the surface energy of these vortices here they are positive so they don't form but in type 2 the surface energy is negative so increasing surface energy helps to reduce free energy and you have vortices this kind of vortices so these are magnetic flux <coughs> flux that is a sort of embedded in the basic matrix matrix so that means these will be superconducting parts and the vortices are because they are magnetized magnetic they are non superconducting parts this is a mixture of this so now the question comes that if there are vortices if I allow them to form a lattice now this each vortice is re repelling each other so when two materials two particles are repelling each other equally then these vortices should form a hexagonal lattice common sense so this is a hexagonal lattice that is so now the length scale of this hexagonal lattice is large unlike crystallographic structure there is an ordered structure here but the length scale is large of the order tens of nanometer so that means even if I, I see a Bragg peak from this lattice it should be at the low key and that is where the sans becomes very important <coughs> sans becomes very important now I will give you an example a very very interesting example worth showing so okay I sorry I overshot a little uh, before I talk about the vortex first lattice I should have mentioned this I'm sorry about this actually in case of D22 at ILL you have the facility of doing small angle neutron scattering and small angle excess scattering simultaneously on the sample uh, so you can do suns in this direction and in the same sample you have got a small angle excess machine which detects the Sachs data in this direction so you have cross the sample with neutron beam and small angle x-ray beam and you can do in-situ studies and later you can stitch the data so this is what actually I was talking about that in our system we have to take out the sample from m sounds and col co collect the Sachs data here you can do it at the same time in D22 now I will go back to vortex lattice so vortex lattice 
in a DOF superconductor using SANS. That is my target. So I talked to you about type to superconductor in which there are vertices. Now in conventional earlier superconductors, the coupling between the electrons were between up spin and down spin and they were called S wave superconductors and <coughs> the S wave superconductor had an order parameter which is spherical and for a spherical S wave superconductor the vortex lattice as I told, showed, told you it should be a hexagonal structure. Now comes a new high TC superconductors like YBCO, yttrium barium copper oxide, it's a D wave superconductor. The D wave superconductor means basically you can see this is a D wave order parameter. So unlike this, it has got a D wave like this. And it's a copper oxide plane, copper oxygen plane, in which if the holes are doped, and basically it's a D wave superconductor and Without getting into the argument how D wave superconductor is justified, but there are some observations in the D wave superconductor. One is that under high field, this hexagonal lattice, which I find in S wave superconductors, initially at low field for D wave superconductors, they will form a hexagonal lattice between the vortices that are embedded in the matrix. But as we increase the field, the hexagonal lattice should distort to a square lattice. Now let's see. This is the experimental result. This is done at a small angle instrument. You can see this is the low field data. This is the 4 tesla data and as you go to nearly 11 tesla, you get the square lattice. So this experiment is a huge justification for accepting that Q, this YBCO is a D wave superconductor. Actually, these are the new justifications for accepting that the superconducting order parameter need not be just S wave, square lattice. And this square lattice is an observation of high field vortex lattice. This is a live picture from a YBCO sample. This is an excellent result and you can see that so far we have been discussing applications, chemistry. This is deep physics observation where it justifies of the fact that YBCO, YBCO is D wave superconductor. I will Come back to these superconductors later when we talk about thin films. But with this example, I draw curtain on examples in SANS experiments. And now we will move forward to other mesoscopic techniques like neutron reflectometry. Thank you.